Continue where where I kind of left off this morning. Uh, who remembers the titles of the message from this morning? Stick to the script. Stick to the script. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I'm going to try and not do too much revision. Just kind of dive in. But I began this morning by just saying there was when I was away there was three things that the Lord spoke to me that that, and that we would need to fulfil our mission. Three very simple, basic things: humility. Integrity and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Humility. Let that mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. He, he, he stripped himself. He, he didn't think it robbery to, to say that he was equal with God. Amen. But he stripped himself of all of that and he came down and he took on the form of a servant, a bond servant. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, let this, just let. He, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, humility, integrity, Holy Spirit, just let it. Just let that mind be in you. In text, it just, from Colossians it says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Just let the word of God dwell in you richly. You know, if, the, if the word of God lives in you, the word of God will answer the door every time it's knocked. <laughs> Amen. Every time temptation comes knocking. Gee, what did Jesus do? He answered with, you let the word of God answer. Yeah. Devil came and said this and this and this and he just said it is written, it is written, it is written. Yeah. Amen. And nothing's possible without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Just humble ourselves to that place of just, I'll just take God at his word. Whatever he says, I'm going to agree with that. I'm one spirit with him. That's, that's spiritual integrity. First Corinthians 6, 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Amen. Glory to God. So let his life, it's about his life. It's not about our life. It's about his life manifesting in our life. So, but when we were there as well, I remember how we'd been launched out from there 32 years ago in, in, in 1991. And, and, and uh, we were launched out prophetically on, on, on what I believe is Jesus' mission statement. And so Jesus' mission statement is our mission statement from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance. Amen. To the captives. 
recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the, the year of the Lord's favour, the year when the free favours of God profusely abound, it says in the Amplified Bible. Amen. Amen. That was our mission statement. That's Jesus' mission statement, and that was the mission statement that we were given. Amen. Amen. Anyway, so I wasn't going to, so the, 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 the first part of this message will be online by now, I'd imagine. Should be uploaded by now. And so I said there was three life lessons I wanted to share. And the first life lesson I wanted to share to help us is, is that the most debilitating and limiting thing that we can allow in our lives is needing people to like us. If you need people to like you, you'll never fulfill your mission. When Jesus went back to Nazareth to, to, his, to his home synagogue and stood up and read his mission statement, People who used to like him didn't like him anymore. <laughs> the guy who was probably on the door and welcomed him in and said, oh, it's good to see you, Jesus. I haven't seen you for a while. I heard you were down the road doing stuff. By the end of the meeting, was leading the group to kill him. Yeah. To throw him off a cliff. So if you need people to like you, you're going to struggle to fulfill your mission. Because we are not here to get people to like us. Do you hear that? I said, you're not here to get people to like you. Right. Some people think the church is here to get people to like us. <laughs> well, hallelujah. You know that some people will leave churches and isolate themselves because they think there's some people there who don't like them. You know what? They're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> but as a result of leaving on, the ba- on that basis, they can end up missing their destiny. Mm-hmm. Which is not to be liked by everybody. Our destiny is to preach good news to the poor, to heal the broken heart. You know, in, 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 in the old covenant, it talks about the sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite heart. God does not despise these things. But God heals these things. But you know, there's a lot of people who have broken hearts who don't know they have a broken heart. Every one of us was born with a broken heart first time around. Because a broken heart, as I've said so many times, is the result of a broken relationship. And we were born and our relationship with our Father in Heaven was broken. In fact, He wasn't even our Father in Heaven. We had no knowledge of Him being a Father in Heaven. Of having a Father in Heaven. And you're not, He doesn't become your Father in Heaven until you're born again. No. You can tell everybody agreed with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. And I was remembering something just, just yesterday afternoon. I was, I was remembering a story I'd heard years and years and years ago. Of, uh, I wasn't necessarily going to say this tonight, but here I am. We're on it. We're on it. Hallelujah. And, and a story I heard many years ago of an old Highland minister. And, and in those days, Highland, and the Highlands ministers were well-respected people, you know, so they could go and knock the door of one of the big houses if they were travelling around and they'd be, they would be given accommodation and they'd be, they'd be catered for. So he, he, this guy was travelling from one place to another, probably on horseback or in a, in a carriage and... It was getting late at night and he's, he, went, he saw this big house and he, he'd been there I think once or twice before and it was going to be one of the landed gentry and so he goes and knocks on the door and of course a servant comes to the door and, he, 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 they, and they recognise him and they, they invite him in and, and uh, he's given bed and, and board. But well, he's down in the kitchen, you know, he's not, he's not put into the, the best rooms or anything like that but, you know, but they accommodate him and so he's, he's down in the kitchen and he's talking to, 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 to this young servant girl and He's talking to her about, about Jesus. He's talking about her, to her about her need for salvation. He's, he's telling you know, he said, you're a sinner and you're going to hell unless you, get, unless you, unless you receive Jesus as your saviour. And it was just bouncing off her the way it does so often. <laughs> and she was a kind of happy, well, kind of person. And she was, she was, she just, and he, he was shocked at just how blasé she was about it all. And, and um, he said, he said to her, he said, in fact, he, he went to bed that night and he, he was so troubled by, by, her, by her reaction to what he was saying that there wasn't even any kind of response whatsoever. Like you'll find very often these days, amen. Yeah. You say that to people, man. In fact, I'll throw this in here right now. See, I believe the pendulum has swung so far in the church that, you know, we went from hellfire and brimstone non-stop to... I mean, somebody was telling me recently they were in a, a church like ours on the mainland for, for four years and never heard hell mentioned once. And I was talking to a young man while I was away and, and who, who's, who's part of a very uh, full-on couple of thousand people Pentecostal church 
uh, and who's very involved in the youth. I said, when's the last time? Well, I was having a coffee with him one day. I said, when's the last time you heard somebody mention hell? He says, I don't think I've ever heard anybody mention hell. <laughs> so the pendulum has swung so far that we major now continually on grace and righteousness, which are wonderful. Yeah. But sin and hell are no longer mentioned. No. Sin and judgment are no longer mentioned. So that, that tells me something's wrong somewhere, that the pendulum has to swing back, not to right over the other side, but needs to come back in to the middle somewhere. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, this, this, old, this, this preacher, he, he goes to bed, he's troubled, he's, he can hardly sleep, and, 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 and he, he wakes up, he gets up in the morning, he goes back down to the kitchen for breakfast, same servant girl was there. He says, he says, look, he says, I'm on my way up, up the north right now, he said, but I'm going to be passing back through here in, 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 in two or three weeks. He said, now I'd like you to do something for me, will you do that? She said, oh yes, I'll do anything you want. He said, will you pray and ask God to show you yourself? Mm-hmm. So that's all I want to ask you. You just ask God to show you yourself. And he bid her farewell and off he went. Two or three weeks later, he's, he's passing through again and he goes back, knocks on the door, they welcome him in. He, he, he asks, where's the servant girl? She says, oh, she's in her room, she's been there for three days. Can't get her out. He says, will you show me where she is? And they took her up and he goes into the room and there's the girl and she's just, she's, she's, She's a bit of a mess. <laughs> Her soul is so troubled and, and she's just she's, she's in, in real distress. And he says, look, he says, you need to change your prayer. Uh-huh. This is what you need to do. Just ask the Lord to show you himself. Hallelujah. And by the next morning that she was through and in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. And she'd come to the kingdom the right way. She'd come to the kingdom the prescribed way if you stick with the script. But if you leave the script, you come up with a hundred different ways of getting into the kingdom. That's the prescribed way. Through repentance and faith. But it's hard to repent when you don't think you've got anything to repent of. So, because we don't tell them you've got anything to repent of, we just scrap the repentance step and let's just go with the faith step. And let's say, well, Jesus did it all. He knows Jesus did it all. And like I said this morning, I don't know if I said it in the message, but I said it later on at the time, in the time of worship. I did mention in, in, during the, in the morning say, uh, the message that, that, you know, what it says in Hebrews, that, that God loves those whom he, God, God chastens those whom he loves. And that he scourges every son whom he receives. And later on, I began to think about it a little bit more, and I thought, so later on I did share this, that, the reason, see, we think, well, yeah, Jesus took our scourging. And he did. But he took our scourging to qualify us to enter into the kingdom. And then it says in Hebrews, which is not the old covenant, which is the new covenant, that every son that he receives on the basis of what Jesus did, he also scourges. So we can't dodge our scourging. <laughs> he, wants us, he wants us to be aware of, our, of who we are in and of ourselves. Why? Because until we understand that, we don't feel our need for him. Mm-hmm. It's when we discover who we truly are. You know, Jeremiah put it this way, he said, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That is the heart of man. He didn't say the heart of some men, he said the heart of man. That was God who said that, by the way, through Jeremiah. And so... The heart of every man before he's born again is deceitful above all things. So the most the thing that's that's most prevalent in your heart before you're born again is deceitfulness. You're deceived. You think you're not a bad person. You think you're okay. You're thinking that if you died without Jesus, then there's no way God could refuse you entry into heaven. And desperately Wicked, I mean, that's strong language. Yes. That's strong language. And I, I believe so many people are in the kingdom today and they've missed this step of understanding who they really were before they were born again. Mm-hmm. And because of that, they don't really feel their need, their desperate need for Jesus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> their desperate need for his righteousness. Yeah. Because they, were, they thought they were all right in the first place. Whom God... Let's get this right. Whom God loves, yeah. he chastens. Right. 
New covenant. Whom God loves, he disciplines. I mean, we know that spirit of the age has tried to remove discipline from every arena of life. They took it out of the schools. That was the biggest mistake they ever made. The teacher surrendered it. How deceived is that? It's taken it, it's now, it's now illegal in, in, in Scotland, according to the, the legislation introduced by the Scottish Parliament, to discipline your child. Using any physical means whatsoever. You could be reported and your children could be removed from your home. Who's behind that? Well, certainly not God. Not the God who loves people. Because whom God loves, he chastens. Whom God loves, he disciplines. I believe that there's many people in the kingdom right now who missed that step. And what's happened is, it's like putting an elastoplast or a a band-aid or whatever on on a festering wound. So some people are sitting in church thinking everything's wonderful when really they've just had a band-aid applied to their festering wound because they never ever knew who they were. They never ever really came face to face with a desperate need for Jesus. They never ever experienced a broken heart over sin. Yes. Mm. Jesus said he came to heal the broken heart. But <laughs> don't point and tell it. Jesus came to heal your broken heart. All right, fair enough. What do I need to do? I'll say this wee prayer. Oh, that's you. Okay, now your broken heart's healed. Excuse me? (laughs) And they don't understand that underneath underneath this little band-aid of of, of evangelical nonsensity that has been applied to the festering wound, the wound is still festering. And festering wounds produce poison. And poison spreads. I can see you all enjoying this message. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll just preach myself happy up here. Glory to God. Amen. See, I, I know by preaching this, some people might not like me. I don't care. <laughs> because I know I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to bring good news. This is good news. This ain't bad news. This is the best news you maybe have heard in a long time. That if you, if you have not, you need to understand, if you, if you truly love God and, 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 you, and your heart is after him, you might have dodged the process thus far, but you will not be able to dodge this process forever. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that it says that in, in one of Paul's epistles that he said there will be some who will be saved us through fire. So that means even if you manage to get through this life, but when you, when you come to the end of this life, there's going to be a not very pleasant experience for you. Why? So that you can be redeemed, so that your spirit might be saved in the day of salvation. Because yeah. that's God's heart to save you. Yeah. Because he loves you. So it's far better that we don't skip any parts of the process, but that we submit ourselves to God and yield ourselves to him and allow him to lead us the way he, only he can lead us into a new place because if you don't come through that process and you live your whole life just with this ticket in your back pocket with heaven stamped on it thinking everything's okay you're going to miss out on everything that you were created to enjoy yeah. in this life <laughs> you're going to miss out on your place in this mission Amen because you don't really know you don't really have good news testimony to share with people if you don't know that your broken heart got healed yeah. Yeah. because you didn't know you had a broken heart in the first place because you never experienced that broken heart that brokenness over sin that said that, 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 that put a steel on the inside of you that said no more sin for me no more sin, sin stuff for me sin is my enemy it's my sworn enemy and I know it's never brought anything into my life and it, and because it's poison and it spreads. Yeah. You introduce it into your family, it spreads through your family. Yeah. It's poison. Poison kills people. Wow. Come on. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm anointed to preach good news, to heal the broken hearted, to tell them there's a remedy for sin. Hallelujah. There's a solution to their sinfulness. There's a, there's, there's a way to break them free from their habitual, ongoing struggle 
with that diabolical mess of sin. There's a way to be free from that. I'm here to preach deliverance to those who are captive to that. I'm here to open their eyes so that they can see who they are, so they can embrace everything that I am. Hallelujah. That's the full gospel. <laughs> that's not a half gospel, that's the full gospel. I say, it's, it's, it, gets, it gets really troubling when people say that they can be in, in churches that are, you know, that, 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 that we feel like good people, you know, trying to do what they believe is right to do, but they're, they're not speaking about stuff that Jesus spoke about. In other words, they're not sticking to the script. <laughs> well, Jesus said, I will build my church. That's his vision statement spoke about that this morning. So his mission statement, Luke 4, 18 and 19 I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. That's, that's his vision statement. As I said, it's the greatest faith statement, I believe, that, that, that's ever been spoken. I will build my church. So when he's looking at some of the things that's going on in the church, you're like, wow, that's some statement, Jesus. Yeah. But he said it and he will do it. Yeah. One way or another, he will do it. Because he said it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you are building your church. Hallelujah. And the very gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it or hold out against it or be strong to its detriment, the Amplified Bible says. Because we're not just a church on the defensive, we're a church on the offensive. At least we're supposed to be a church on the offensive. When you go out and preach this message, the kingdoms of darkness are very offended. Yeah. And those who have aligned themselves with the kingdoms of darkness are very offended. And those who have been taken captive by the devil to do his will are very offended. But it's the only way to set the precious people that Jesus went to the cross for to set them free. It's the only way that God's heart can be, and his, his, his will and his purpose can be realized in the salvation of many. Hallelujah. Only truth, only truth. Only truth sets people free. Only by the entrance of God's word comes light that penetrates the darkness, that splits the darkness wide open. Hallelujah. And shows people there's a way of escape. Amen. Come on. Amen. Our destiny is not to be light by everybody. It's to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. And, and, you know, in, in the last awakening that this island experienced, and, and whenever it was, 1949 to 53, you know, the, 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 the evangelist that God kind of uh, used quite a lot in, at that time, um, although he, he, he was a very honest man, very humble man, he said, he said what, what God was doing was long, had long begun before I arrived. Yeah. That's not always the way the book's presented, but that's, that was the statement of the man's own mouth. And you know that, see, he, he, had, he had been a successful evangelist, Prior, prior to that, but he had, he had then he'd found a comfortable place of ministry down somewhere down in Argyleshire, and he had a church and he had a manse and, and everything was fine. His family were there, and, and he was getting a nice salary, and, and he and uh, he started to be infected by some of the liberal. Te- this is going back a long time, but some of the liberal teaching that was that was going at the time, he started to be infected by that. He started to take some of it on board. I said, when you, st- when, 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 you, when, you, when you don't stick to the script, you start to add lib. You start to add liberal theology. Mm-hmm. It's out there all the time. It's the devil's message trying to infiltrate the church, trying to corrupt the church, trying to contaminate the church. And he started to take some of that on board. And, 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 and one, 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 one day his daughter, his young daughter, when she was 14 or 15, came to him and said, Daddy, can I speak to you? She said, yes, of course. I think she went to his study and knocked the door and, and she went in and he said, can I speak? She said, she, she said where, where, where's all the fire you used to have? But I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember exactly what she said, but she was basically saying, where's, where's the zeal you had to, for the lost? And it so convicted him that he did not sleep. He, 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 was, on the, he was on the floor all night crying out to God, saying, God, I need that fire back. I need that fire back. And he, was, he received a mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Yeah. And at the time when he was invited to come here to Lewis, he, he, he came across on the, on the ferry, not a ferry like we have, an old boat tub. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and, 
And he, he arrived in Stornoway, and some of the elders from Barbara's, the church that had invited him, were on the pier to meet him. Apparently, one of the old el- elders said to him, he said, Mr. Campbell, he said, what's that? He says, are you walking with God? Yeah. He said, well, all I can tell you is this, I fear God. <laughs> I fear God. Why? Because he'd had an encounter with God. And see, we're not talking here about fear and, oh, I'm so scared of God. That, that reverence for God that says, <laughs> You cannot have an encounter with God and not, and not have that sense mm-hmm. of reverence for him. It's impossible. Yeah. Every single last man or woman of God has ever been used in any way, in any time of awakening in the church has had an experience like that. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you have an experience like that, you, you, you just can't make do with all of the waffle anymore. No. Woolly church doesn't suit anymore. Mm-hmm. Amen. It just doesn't work. I don't know about you, but I, I can't be bored with all that stuff. <laughs> I'm meeting too many people who are telling me that the, that the script has been abandoned. Or at least it's been amended. <laughs> if we don't stick into the script, then we're going to miss it. Mm-hmm. We're going to miss our destiny. I said it this morning, uh, uh, later, later no, after, I think after the message I shared, I, 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 can, I can take you to the place tonight. I could take you right there, right now, and, and tell you the place where God spoke to me in 1991 and said, you need, I want you to enlist people for the SES. I wasn't entirely sure what he was talking about. Then he said, saved and the sanctified. Those who are not just content to know that they're saved, but those who know they've been set apart by God, for God, to be part of his spirit. You know, it says in First Peter uh, two verse nine that we are his own special people. Well, I like to think of that as his own special forces. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah! Why? Because we are here to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty with the kingdom of God's special forces to go into the places of darkness and bring liberty to those who are bound. Amen. And their only offensive weapon, my friend, is the word of God, Amen. the sword of the Spirit. Everything else is defensive, but that's offensive. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And it always will be offensive. And so if you need people to like you, then you better not preach the word of God. You better not stick to the script. You better go off and invent your own. Rewrite it. Because some people are not going to like you. I better move this forward. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Isn't he excited? Pretty excited, isn't it? Hallelujah. And he said to announce the see, this is not a, you can pick and choose, this is not like uh, Woolworth's pick and mix. You don't just pick and mix this, this is, a, this is an order. You've got to follow God's order. God does things in an order. When God says things in an order, he wants you to follow that order. Yeah. Just like when he gives you an order, he wants you to follow the order. Amen? Yeah. See, anyone, any, any, in any, in any uh, military operation, someone who doesn't follow orders is a liability. They're the ones who can, who can abort the whole mission. Yeah. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. You alright with that? Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I can't tell by your faces right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not entirely sure. Look at the people like this. They've got deers and headlights kind of look. But anyway. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. <laughs> so you get to the end of it and it says, To announce the acceptable year of the Lord's favour. The day when salvation and the free favours of God profusely abound. But you've got to come through. You've got to come through getting your broken heart healed. You've got to have your, understand you've got a broken heart. You need, to be, you need to have a broken heart over sin and then you have that broken heart healed. And that brings you in a place where you're able to receive the message of deliverance. Amen. Where your eyes are open to the reality, the true spiritual realities. Any areas of oppression in your life, you're set free from them. Your days of being depressed are over. You're on a mission now. You've got a purpose. Depressed people are purposeless people. They've lost their vision. They've lost their, their, their purpose in life. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And then you're able to hear finally about the Lord's goodness. Mm. Stuff we tried to apply as an elastoplast before, you know. 
to the brokenhearted, to the people who'd never come through the process. We just try to stick all this stuff on them. And we wonder why it didn't work. I don't know if you, I've spent years and years and years thinking, what in the world's going on here, Lord? We are preaching such good news and it's just bouncing off. Because you've got to follow the order. That's called putting first things first and keeping the main thing the main thing. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's called sticking to the script. You know, you get people who sit down and they, what did I come up with? It's called binging on TV series, you know. But to be perfectly frank, if you're watching one of them things, you'd be as well watching the first one and then watching the last one. <laughs> <laughs> But you can't do that with the Word of God. You've got to stick to the script. Because every episode leads you into the next episode. You can't skip an episode and not lose your way in the story. So I said, well, the reality is that not everyone will like you. But if you choose, if you choose to enlist... You you can't choose to enlist in the SES. You can choose to apply (laughs) <laughs> That's true. Is that true or is that true? In fact, you're already, you're already part of the British Army. You're already a, a regular soldier. You're already, you're already qualified to be a soldier. But now you're saying, I want to be on the cutting edge of what the British Army does. And they said, oh, that's okay. Well, that's fine. Right? And, they, and they, they, they ensure that you're, that you're fit enough, physically fit enough for that, that you're mentally fit enough for that. And then they say, well, okay, well, you can begin the process. <laughs> And like I said this morning, I think in, 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 the, in the kind of uh, the epilogue, <laughs> one, one instructor, one SAS instructor said, he said, we're, we're not trying to fail you, we're trying to kill you. Because until all, every part of your flesh that says, I can't do this, is dead, you'll fail yourself. You, can't, you cannot fail the test. You can only give up on it. Once you quit, you failed. If you don't quit, you can't fail. If you keep on going and keep on going and keep on going, you'll pass. But the moment you say, I can't do this anymore, you're finished. It's all over. You failed. So they didn't fail you. You failed yourself. You quit. You gave up. But if they can succeed in killing you, you'll make it. That's the same in the kingdom of God. Till every part of you is dead. You're liable to quit at some point. Because the pressures that come against you are intense. When you're on that cutting edge. You've got got to be so sharp in the spirit. To stay there. To stay in that place. Of being effective in this mission. You know. I I hate some of these, these pictures that showed up. When they started doing paintings of Jesus, you know, with the long hair, the happy look, and the beard, and the blue eyes, the bright blue eyes shining, absolute waffle, pathetic. I want to tell you, Jesus was a hard man. I'm not talking about that the way the Glasgow people talk about being a hard man. <laughs> like I share that what happened in the Peterhead prison riot back, and I can't remember when it was when. The, when they, when, they, when they took that poor prison officer captive up on the roof and they were chucking bits <coughs> off the roof and, they, were, and, they, and they, they, they stabbed him twice and they beat him up several times and they, they filled his pockets full of lighter fuel and threatened to set him in fire. And then they brought in the SAS. But nobody knew it until years after that the SAS had been there. They brought him in, immediately went in there, blew a hole in the thing, took that guy out, got him, got him set free. And they were back, back down in whatever, they, whatever they're based in time for a second breakfast, one guy said. But one guy said this, he said, the, the self-styled hard men of Peterhead Prison were like little pussycats. Because as soon as they knew the SEA, these guys were involved, they just backed off straight away <coughs> and gave up, their, they gave up their pathetic fight. <laughs> like pussycats in the face of the real hard men. Of the SES, that's what they said. That's what was said. I'm going to tell you, Jesus was a hard man. 
How do you know he was a hard man? Don't you? Well, he was a hard man in the truest sense of the word. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, he, he had a pretty successful ministry at one point. Amen. I mean, a lot of people didn't like him, but he was doing pretty good. He, would, he could attract thousands of people. Healings, deliverances, miracles, man, boom, 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 here we go. Fantastic. People followed him around. And then Father says, Okay, Jesus, it's time for the cross. Time for the cross. And you know what? You know what it says? You know why I say he's a hard man? I was just meditating. This is, I was having fun this afternoon, just chewing on. I love chewing on the word of God, amen. I love just spending time in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and saying, more truth, more truth, more truth. He says he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross. That's a hard man. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he, 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 he says to his disciples, Look, guys, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. My soul is exceedingly, listen to the language, exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Every part of me, he's sinless. He doesn't deserve to die in any, any, in any way, never mind on a cross. Certainly not taking the sins of the whole world upon himself. Every part of him, his sinless soul is saying, No way! His flesh is he's, he's, he's resisting the temptation to give up so much that he's sweating drops of blood. That's a hard man. And in the midst of it all, he draws on the resource that has deposited on the inside of him, his, his spirit, and he draws on the power of God, and he says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will. I'm on a mission. I refuse to abort this mission. I refuse to quit. <laughs> on this mission. I didn't understand when the Lord said in list people for the SES. I can understand when people came and then they went and they just came and they flew and I couldn't figure out all the reasons and I thought, what's going on? Because it's hard to stick to the script. Especially when you feel that you need to be liked or accepted. You've got to be a hard man. I'm not talking about hard as an uncompassionate. In fact, the very opposite. See, the real hard men, I'm, I'm using this analogy, you understand. I, I, I don't, I don't, the, the real hard men of, these, of, of, this, of, the, of, of the special forces in the natural, they're the guys you can send into the most difficult situations to deliver yeah. the most vulnerable people. Yeah. And at the, at, the, at the risk of their own lives, every second their lives are in danger, but they're willing to do that. How much more in the kingdom of God as God's special forces... Should we have that same heart, that level of compassion that says, I know this and that I'm, everything's in danger right now, but I will not abort this mission. I will do whatever needs to be done to see this accomplished, mission accomplished. Amen. We'll get, this, we'll get through this. <laughs> See, I believe if you keep the main thing, the main thing, if you remain consistent with your testimony, if you remain consistent with your message, hey, let, let, me, let, let me remind us what the Lord said. The Lord spoke this to me. I was reading in, in Proverbs, and he, he, he spoke this to me, and I wrote it, and I still got it on my Bible. It was April um, 2007. I wrote the date down. He said, I've not been building a ministry through you. See, that's, that's, the, that's the goal of most people who, who get involved in the kingdom. They want to build a ministry. Amen? Because that, that's the way we were, we were trained. Wrongly. We were wrongly trained that way. That's most people's ambition. And most people will clap you on the back and encourage you in that. But it's wrong. He said, I've not been, I, this, this was the most, one of the most liberating things I've ever heard. I didn't know it at the time. In fact, I felt a bit peeved about it, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> My flesh hurt a little bit. It, it, it's a bit like, all these years I've been serving you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you're telling me now, I'm not even going to have a ministry anymore. 
That's not what he said, though. That wasn't the end. He said, I've not been building a ministry through you. I've been building a message in you. And out of that message, the ministry will come. But he wasn't talking about a name and lights ministry, necessarily. He was just talking about your opportunities to be one of my special forces and to go into situations and actually make a real kingdom difference yeah. will come. Yeah. Because it's the message, it's the word. Only the entrance of his word brings light, brings deliverance, brings freedom. Let me say this. If over time... If, if, if you remain consistent with your testimony, with your message, I believe that over time, even some of those who don't like you will come to respect you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And respect can be a far stronger bridge than likability. Yes. See, people can like you and still ignore what you say. <laughs> oh, that Don, he's a nice guy. I don't know what he's like. He talks a lot of rubbish, but yeah, he's a nice guy. That Charlie, oh, he's a lovely man. Charlie, oh, lovely. I don't agree with that word he said, but he's lovely. People can like you, still ignore what you say, but when people respect you, they're far more inclined to pay attention to what you say. What did Jesus do when he was rejected and thrown out of Nazareth? Did he, did he retreat to some isolated place to wallow in self-pity? To lick his wounds? Decide that maybe he was wrong and it might be best to stick to just being a nice synagogue-going carpenter? No, he just kept on walking. <laughs> he moved to the next place and got on with the job. That's called putting first things first. Keeping the main thing the main thing. That's called sticking to the script. Luke 4, 32, 32 says, Passing through their midst, he went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with Authority. Amen. Life lesson number two to help us. Life lesson number one, you've got to get over that mess of needing people to like you. Life lesson number two is never stop learning from Jesus. Why? Because that's what Amen. disciples do. <laughs> Amen? Mm-hmm. Just because everyone doesn't like you, doesn't, it doesn't have to be hard. In fact, Jesus said the opposite is true. Now, you think, well, because most, most folks have been saying, well, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Well, Jesus said, my yoke is easy. That's right. Now, really, when you get into the nuts and bolts of it and, and into the nitty gritties of it and you become a part of that, you realise, well, I really understand what he was saying and I really truly believe he was saying it's easier than not being yoked to him. Because <laughs> life without Jesus is miserable. Life without Jesus, regardless of how how comfortable it might look like from the outside is miserable. It's purposeless. It's got no purpose. That's why Jesus invites us to come to us sometimes in our weariness, to come to him and, and come to him with our overburdened souls to learn from him how to take a real rest. He said his yoke is easy, his burden is light. You know that the root of the word easy is ease? Do you know the ease is defined as an absence of difficulty or effort? An absence of rigidity or discomfort? Do you know what? I, I watched a YouTube video. You know the guys that were involved in the Iranian embassy siege? You know they were still following the snooker? They camped out for six days or just along the road from there and they were following the snooker. And the first thing they did after they, after they freed everybody had, all of the hostages went back to catch up with the snooker. <laughs> An absence of difficulty or effort, an absence of rigidity or discomfort, freedom from worries or problems, especially about one's material situation. Hallelujah. What did Jesus say about the the parable of the sword, about the word of God that gets entangled in all of the thorns and the weeds, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness, there's that word again, the deceitfulness of riches, comes in and chokes the word. And they become unfruitful. The mission is aborted. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. And all that is within me. Bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He's looking after us. He's the one taking care of us. He's the one looking out for us. We've got nothing to fear. Amen? So we've got nothing to fear. That's right. I, I love to hear the resounding amen on that. I said we've got nothing amen. to fear. Amen. Because we truly do abide and, and we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Mm-hmm. You know, because you dwell in the secret place, nobody really knows that's where you dwell. No. That's why it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> We abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. He will bring you out of your secret place and you'll go in and you'll do something extraordinary and then you'll come back out and nobody will even know your name. And you'll be happy about that. (laughs) Because you'll know that you've fulfilled your mission. You'll know that you have done and accomplished what you were created to do. That's right. Hallelujah. But your name will be recorded. And one day, when, when, what was it, what they call that when the, when the government releases records and opens up things that have been... Census. What, did, what do they call it? Census. And when things have been... And, and then they open them up after 100 years or something. Yeah. Well, there's things that, you're, that you'll be engaged in that will all be recorded in heaven. And one day the censorship will be removed. And one day all of the stuff that was hidden will be revealed. Hallelujah. And you will receive your reward because you were faithful in the mission that you were given. Hallelujah. Come on. Anyway, I need to move this forward. I'm just going to skip that. Hallelujah. Life lesson number three. A mission statement is a statement of purpose. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because, and then he went on to explain the purpose. Amen? The spirit of the Lord, the anointing, the, the right and ability to do what we could never do on our own. Do you know that? We can do nothing on our own. Jesus said, of myself, I can do nothing. Who do we think we are? <laughs> That's true. If we think we can do things of our own volition. We think that we can just conjure things up and do things just to make ourselves look better in certain situations. Like I, like I said this morning, man, it came on just like a light bulb in my head when, when I was talking about John the Baptist preaching. There's one greater than me. I thought, whoa, don't ever let your message get beyond that. Keep your message right there. There's one greater than me. I might, I might have a reputation, but I'll tell you, reputations are made to be lost. Jesus decided at the very beginning to be, that he was willing to become of no reputation. Yeah. Let this mind be in you that also was in Christ Jesus who was willing to become of no reputation. Yeah. The right and ability to do what we could never do our own. That's, that's our uniform. The anointing is our uniform. Amen. That's it's the anointing that identifies us as working for our Father in heaven. Because we're, we've been set free to serve people. We've been set free to go in and, and, and be the instruments of deliverance for people. And you can't do that on your own. That's why we, 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 need, we need to be, be in that place where we're just pulling continually on his ability. We can't, the Holy Spirit, he's the essential in our lives. I mean, can you imagine getting a job in Tesco? I'll try and finish with this a wee bit of an illustration. It'll take me a few minutes. But can you imagine if you get, get, I think I used this years ago. Can you imagine getting a job in Tesco, putting on your uniform, then just standing on the shop floor all day doing nothing? People all around you needing help and you just ignore them. I work at Tesco's. Do you like my uniform? <laughs> just put this one on fresh today. <laughs> Excuse me, oh, no time for that. Or maybe they put you in the checkouts and, and they think maybe you'll do better there and all of a sudden <coughs> massive queues form around you as you continue to ignore all the people in the queue. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? You see, our, our, our Ruth and Matt 
her husband Matt, they worked in Asda when they were students, when they were students, and, and I remember Ruth telling me that on several occasions she was shopping in Tesco on her way home from work, and she was still wearing her, her Asda uniform, and people would ask her for directions to the tea, they probably forgot where they were, would ask her for directions to the tea bags or whatever. Now, she could have said, oh, I don't work in Tesco, I work for Asda. But instead she would help them and she would take them to the tea bags. And they would say, oh, thank you very much. How many people in the church say, that's not my job, that's not my title, that's not my role. I don't put out chairs. I'm an apostle. <laughs> Do you not know that I'm an apostle? I'm a prophet. Well, prophetically put out the chairs then. <laughs> have you not prophetically understood yet that if you don't put out chairs, people have got nowhere to sit tonight? <laughs> Go figure, I tell you. That's not my function. Well, well. God help you. <laughs> See, I remember another time I was in Asda and I met Matt upstairs and he was walking from the direction of, of, of the hardware section and I thought, I wonder what he's doing up here because I knew he worked in the dairy aisle. I said, hey, what are you doing up here? I thought I was going to get found out for going to the clothing section again, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> See if I can find you another shirt <laughs> to add to the collection. Flesh die. <laughs> but see, we don't, see, part of the Asda training, actually their mission statement and their mission statement and their value statement says that you help anyone who needs help in any way you can. So, but I said in what you do not feel, he said, well, someone needed help looking for coat hangers. And I knew he worked in the day rail and he said, someone wanted help. Yeah. Look, if somebody obviously met him in the dairy aisle downstairs, away in the middle of the big, big store, and said, where will I find coat hangers? He said, oh, follow me. Follow me. Took him all the way through, the, all the downstairs up to the very end where the, up, the, the escalator was, up the escalator, to the very end of that department, to the hardware section, and said, here's your coat hangers. Here's your coat hangers. How many Holy Spirit baptized people still just show up in church and do the aerobics? <laughs> but still haven't grasped that they're actually anointed to be everything that anybody needs them to be anywhere at any time if they're just willing to stick to the script. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To be that channel of his anointing. To be that hand that reaches out and releases the power of God into somebody's oh, yeah. life. Some folks, someone asks them for help and they point them to somebody else. Well, that's the pastor, you better go and see him. <laughs> I stopped going to a tiny church years ago because I got fed up. People come and say, Well, you must be the preacher. I'm like, They must have seen the halo, the anointing. I said, How do you know? I said, You're wearing a tie. <laughs> Oh, I was always, it was always half strangling me anyway. You used to be like, Oh, it's just murder. <laughs> Some people are just trying to See, when that happens, people have forgotten what it means to put first things first. They've forgotten what it means to keep the main thing the main thing. They've forgot what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and wow. His righteousness. They've forgotten to, how, what it means to stick to the script. Jesus is working towards his vision statement and he is building his church regardless of how much of a shambles it might sometimes appear to be. The church at the gates of hell cannot prevail against. I've preached this for years. God's got a plan A. It's called the local church. There's no plan B. I preached that first nearly 30 years ago. I wrote a book like that back in the day. Made loads of copies and distributed them. They probably disappeared in a charity shop and next, next stop the bin. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> God's plan A, the local church. There is no plan B. But he said, enlist people for the SAS, the saved and the sanctified. I'm looking for stormtroopers. I'm looking for special forces. Hallelujah. Those who are fully committed to my mission being a success. My vision being accomplished. Mm -hmm. You see, he's 
working towards his vision statement, but he's doing it through those who recognise that their purpose is embodied in the outworking of his mission statement. Yeah. As we fulfil his mission statement, as we take on board his mission statement, his vision statement will be fulfilled, but only that way. When we recognise that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me for a purpose to preach good news to those who right now are spiritually and impoverished and if you're spiritually impoverished you're impoverished every other way no matter how much of this world stuff you think you've got yeah. his vision statement has been fulfilled when we get involved in his mission statement it's called putting first things first it's keeping the main thing the main thing it's called sticking to the script you know what Sometimes it means that helping someone in Tesco when you work for Asda and helping someone find coat hangers when you work in the dairy, well, that's what it means. Hope that analogy works for you, but that's what it means. Who knows some folks in Tesco won't like you helping someone in your Asda uniform? Who do you think you are? You'll be stepping on toes. You see, you've got to be totally set free from all that. All the, I don't mind labels. Labels are okay. Labels, labels identify things. It's handy to know that it's Coca-Cola and not Paraquat. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Some people made that sorry mistake and paid dearly for it. Labels are fine. I don't, I don't mind denominational labels. I don't mind church labels and all that sort of stuff because it, it can identify certain things. But <laughs> you can't get hung up on these things. You can't get hung up on these things. You can't be afraid to, to just because you're in amongst the so-and-sos to not bring the truth of God's word because they don't like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you might just be the next candidate for the cliff edge, but so what? You'll do what yeah. Jesus did. You'll walk out yeah. through their midst yeah. and you'll carry on walking and you'll just move on to the next place. Yeah. You know, John Wesley never ever left the Church of England, but he was kicked out of everyone he went to. Yeah. <laughs> You read these diaries I read here and I was thrown out. I was right here, they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> but he never ever removed his, his uh, whatever it was. Just carried on. But th- these things didn't matter to him. Some of your colleagues might not like you leaving the dairy hill to go upstairs and help somebody find coat hangers. You're supposed to be on the dairy hill. Some people, the the biggest critics you'll find in your life are those sitting alongside you in church. Because you've dared to step out and be who God created you to be. Amen. Who God anointed you to be. Because we're here to help people. I said, we need the humility to believe that when God says, I want to bless you, I want to put my anointing on you, that you've got the humility to say, okay, lay it on me. But I won't use it to try and Make an, and fulfill my own personal ambitions I'll use it for what it's designed to do which is to bless people yeah. I recognise I've been set free to free people I've been blessed to bless people yeah. I've been received supernatural help and deliverance so that I can help and deliver people Amen. Hallelujah Thank you. Man, I'll wind this up will I? Are we having fun? Um, Hallelujah, praise the Lord let me just, let me just uh, kind of sum this up. We're not here to get anyone to like us. We're here for one very simple but profound reason. To preach the good news to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance and announce release. This is from the Amplified Bible. To the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty. To send forth as deliver those who are oppressed. Who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed and broken down. By calamity, the world is full of such people. Yeah. You won't have to look far to find your harvest field. Jesus said, just lift <coughs> your eyes a little bit, just move your perspective just a tiny little bit, and you'll discover that you're surrounded by harvest. <laughs> the fields are already white for harvest. And if you don't bring the harvest in, it spoils. You know that, don't you? Amen. I'm working with a guy right now, and he was panicking over the weekend because his, his, his crops that he's put so much work into are, are, are sitting there and if he can't get somebody to come and cut them and, and, and bail them then he could lose them all and I had them one year before yeah. great loss fantastic loss yeah. to 
proclaim the accepted. This is this is when it gets so exciting, man. It's like the accepted and acceptable year. All of a sudden, you've got people who can hear that now. I don't. I'm going to read every day telling people this, and I look. Oh, like fruitcake nutcase. They make jokes about yeah, Let's get another open another bottle and let's have a big glass of whiskey. You know that. And you think I've got the best news you guys have ever heard, and you can't hear it. Because you've got to follow the order. And when you get to the, the, the when you get down there, you discover there are actually people now who can hear the truth. They can hear the truth about salvation and healing and deliverance and freedom and prosperity. You can even, you see, you said I've come and preach good news to the poor. You mentioned prosperity in most places, it's like, ah! Because people, they've got such cardinal minds that they, they think you're talking about you getting rich for your own purposes. You can't be blessed where you can bless somebody, you know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I have. I, I was going to share something. I thought I better not. I think I sound like I'm like a, Katrina won't be impressed if I share this. I better not share it. <laughs> but let me just say this. You know, going back to that as that Tesco kind of analogy. If I, if someone from another church needs help. Yeah. And I can help them. I'm going to help them. Mm-hmm. Not because I'm a sheep stealer, which might be the acute accusation that might come, but because I'm a sheep feeder. Because mm-hmm. I heard very clearly from the Lord one day, he said, don't worry, feed my sheep. Mm-hmm. That's called putting first things first. Yeah. Keeping the main thing the main thing. That's called sticking to the script. In fact, I'll tell you something else. The Lord spoke to me while I was away. and uh, When we were away a, a few weeks ago, and, and I wrote this down. I'm not here to make a mark in the world. It was a great realisation. So many people, that's their aim, to make a mark in the world, isn't it? Isn't it? That's what, that's what, that's what you were taught, wasn't it? That's what sometimes you'll be taught in church. You're here to make a mark in the world, bro. I, I, wrote, I, I, I wrote this down. I'm not here to make a mark in the world. I am here to be obedient to Jesus and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then he, he, I believe he gave me this. Uh, and, if, and if as a result of obedience and being led by the Holy Spirit, my presence in this world makes any kind of an impact, it will be the result of his life in me manifesting his glory. Amen. That's it. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and I wrote this down a couple of days ago. I think maybe at that time the most important thing that I've ever done I believe in, in, in 32 years of ministry and more than that but 32 years in ministry in New Wine Church was actually obeying the leading of the Holy Spirit at, in the, on, the, on the eve of the first day of lockdown when, the, when he said to me feed my sheep and on that day, I started, I started to, to send out, the next day, the very first day, Lord, I started to send out that morning thought. That's what I said. You can call it whatever you like, but call it morning. I just call it morning thought for convenience sake. And it's been great every day since the first day of lockdown. And you know, you know what's wonderful about it is I have no control over where it ends up. No. I send it out to a few people. But I've no idea where it goes because I know some people send it out beyond them to other people who send it out to other people. And, I, and, and very occasionally I receive encouragement from places I've no idea where or who they are. And I'll probably never meet them this side of eternity. Mm-hmm. Words of encouragement saying, this blesses me. That, that when I have to have time to spend my time with the Lord and I, read, and I listen to that and it feeds me. Someone, someone, a, a third, someone sent to a friend who I sent, who I don't, who I sent it to someone who sends it to them, who sends it to this other person who sends it, and they, they sent me what this person had sent them, and they said, I send it all over. You need to understand, I send this all over the world. Here's some of the feedback I'm getting. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, because it's God's word, <laughs> and it's feeding somebody, and just that little tiny little bit of obedience, every, you know. It costs a little bit, you know, in the sense of it costs your flesh a little bit. You've got to spend time seeking the Lord, reading through his word and saying, what do you want me to put out today and help me to write this, help me to put this together and record this and send it out. Hallelujah. And I think we're on, well, tonight we'll be on day 1259 or something ridiculous. 
every single day since the first day of lockdown because you see and I'll tell you just a few weeks after I started this I was and I just finished with this but some of you heard this before but the Lord was bringing this back to my remembrance quite recently because we're living in days where that sort of stuff can happen again just like that mm-hmm. but I was, I was in the mill and because I was one of the ones that just carried on working through the whole mess we were off for a week and then I, was in, uh, I said I'd come back and, and a few of us just went back and over the months, took months for some people to ever come back. Just kept the thing going, kept the truck moving. But I was doing the most mundane job you can possibly do in our department, which is stripping old yarn off old used bobbins and dumping them in a bag. I was just there, I was just standing there doing this and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, this is what he said, and this is the way he said it, and he said it in a kind of funny kind of way that probably helped to get my attention. He said, this ain't no lockdown. This is a siege. Uh-huh. It began with a backdown, and it will end in a shakedown if there is no showdown. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, what do you need to do when people are in a siege? You need to keep feeding them. What's the first thing that runs out in a time of siege? Mm-hmm. Food. Food. So the Lord really encouraged me there and he said, he said, just keep feeding my sheep. Because a lot of them are locked into that place of siege. And they need to receive the hope that's contained, the supernatural hope that's contained in my word. They need to receive a steady supply of that. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Glory to God. That, 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 and he said, this, this is part of your special mission. <laughs> like I say, just release it and it goes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's up to the Holy Spirit and who gets it and how they respond to it and how they receive it and whether they reject it or whether it feeds them or whether it doesn't, whether they receive nourishment from it because it, it contains nourishment. Hallelujah. Make you up, build you, make you strong from the inside out. Hallelujah. It's not a vain exercise. And he- heaven will reveal it. Praise God. Amen. I I believe that. I believe that. I said, I believe that. Just like those in in the natural who who join special forces know, believe that what they're doing is making a difference. Whether they ever get their name in lights or not, and they don't. I said it was even years later until until they actually revealed that the SES had been involved in that Peterhead mess. Hallelujah. Anyway, let's stand up. I could preach all night, you know that, don't you? <laughs> I take my mission seriously. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and He's anointed me to preach good news because it's the only way of setting people free. So the Holy Spirit comes. Hey, are you in? Are you in? Are you, are you in for, for, the, for, the, for the process? Hallelujah. Are you ready to apply to move up a level? You're already in the kingdom, but God says, I'm looking for people to move up a level. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord. Lord, we're surrounded by people with broken hearts who don't even know it. Lord, I pray you'd help us, anoint us, Lord. If the pendulum has swung too far, Lord, help us to be open to the Holy Spirit to, to, to bring that message, Lord, that, that, that reveals to people that, hey, You've got a broken heart because of sin. There's only one way to have that broken heart healed. And that's to recognise your desperate need for the healer. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for a, a, a new awakening amongst our community, Lord. That awakening to righteousness. That we would awake to righteousness and no longer play around with sin. Because there's so many people who have no understanding of your heart and your purpose and your will for this world and for the people of this world. Help us, Lord, to sign our name on the dotted line tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, be glorified. Amen. 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 Amen.